Thank you. Good morning. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, root modeling. Uh, we're interested in developing crops that need less water, nitrogen, and phosphorus. And so to do that, uh, we develop idiotypes as breeding goals composed of distinct traits or fiends that people can select for in a breeding program. Um, now, when we're interested in, in soil resources, the biology of how roots interact with these resources is quite complex. And there's many different scenarios that have to be considered. So we have developed uh, a tool to help us think through some of these as a heuristic device uh, called SimRoot. And here's an example a SimRoot. This is what's happening right now in Illinois. Uh, people have planted corn, they've applied nitrogen, rain is washing that nitrate down into the profile and the roots are taking it up in a dynamic, interactive way. And so this is a visualization of, of that process uh, showing um, a couple of noteworthy things. Unlike shoot models or unlike shoot processes, the resource availability is very dynamic in time and space. And uh, growth itself is responsive to resource capture. And there's a lot of different, I don't know if you can see very well at this resolution, but there's tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of root segments in these models that have to be considered. Um, so SimRoot is just, in a nutshell, a brute force uh, uh, functional structural model, finite element approach. At its core, it's a data structure, extensible tree data structure. Uh, so we have some of the things you've heard about already, and I think you're familiar with. Uh, you know, whole plant attributes. Uh, we have a canopy model attached to SimRoot that's feeding at carbon and using minerals, um, photosynthesis, for example. But then the, the core of our focus here are these root segments whose uh, ability to grow and interact with the soil is then um, determined by functions that are tacked on to the extensible tree data structure. So it's written in C++ with some Fortran libraries. We, it's, had about 25 years of development at Penn State, but now it's, we have development nodes at Forsham Centrum Ulish in Germany and University of Nottingham. And to, to make these models, this model work, we need uh, empirical data at millimeter scale resolution, which normally does not exist in the literature, so we've had to generate a lot of unique data to, to parameterize these models. We have models running for maize, bean, lupin, squash, barley, and Arabidopsis, and we're developing models for wheat and rice right now. Shimmer is about 135,000 lines with about 1,000 files and folders. It's just this month we finished the legal arrangements to make this fully open source. Um, so it, perhaps in contrast to what I understand, Andrew, Andrew was just talking about, we feel that, or at least I feel, I, I don't trust anybody's model if I can't look at the actual code. So we want this code to be open source. But on the other hand, we have no user interface at all. So there's a steep learning curve to using this particular tool. So here's an example. I was talking about the parameterization. I showed you a, a visualization of uh, nitrate capture by a growing maize root system. So it, one of the inputs SimRoot is looking for is how does nitrate uptake kinetics change on a millimeter scale resolution in the maize root system over time? So we had to generate this with empirical research. So for example, here you see a heat map uh, showing the variation in a maize root system of the uh, maximum velocity of nitrate uptake and this is the uh, uh, Michaelis constant, the affinity constant for nitrate uptake, michaelis mentens constant. These, these are the kinds of things that SimRoot needs, and so we've generated these for our species. So I want to give you just a few examples of uh, some of the uh, things we've done with SimRoot, some of the utility of SimRoot in that particular case of uh, a maize root system uh, catch, catching uh, uh, nitrogen or water. That was the idiotype I showed you. That was steep, cheap, and deep idiotype. We're going deep maize roots to capture nitrogen and water. So I'll give you a few examples. So the first case I want to talk about is the case of root cortical arenchyma. This is not a computer model. This is an actual root segment that's been ablated with a laser. And you can see those green areas is actually airspace. Uh, living cells are turned into air. And so here's significant genetic variation for that in maize. This genotype has no arenchyma in the cortex. This closely related genotype has a lot of arenchyma. And so we had done research showing that this process makes roots metabolically cheaper, obviously, because you're turning living cells into airspace, so they need less carbon and nutrients and so on. And we thought, well, this might be a useful adaptation to nutrient stress. 
but we weren't sure how important it was likely to be, and so this is where we turn to SIMRU as a heuristic tool. So here we have, once again, we have parameterized maze routes. We know how and when and where they, they uh, form a Renkema, and you can see the heat map here. It's a dynamic process. And we also know how Renkema formation is related to respiration, nutrient transport, and other processes. And so the model is then capable of telling us how important this is likely to be. So here we have a simulation where two identical maize phenotypes, one without a Renkema, one with, growing in a low phosphor soil. Now there is a shoot here that we're not visualizing that's providing carbon. And you can see over time, the phenotype with a Renkema grows better in low phosphor soil. And so what's happening is every little segment of root here that has a Renkema is cheaper, it's respiring less, needs less phosphorus itself. So it can grow a little bit further, acquire more phosphorus, which is diffusion limited, gets you more photosynthesis, so it's an autocatalytic feed forward type of mechanism where a relatively small change in root respiration has a relatively significant impact on uh, soil resource capture. Um, now this is the kind of thing, that, you know, SimRoot is the way we can put numbers on something we're thinking about in our head. It's actually a very complex problem. Uh, you know, there's like 16 leaves on a maize plant. You can see how many root segments we have, and this is only a flowering. We already have quite a few root segments. Um, so SimRoot tells us that uh, the data from, this, from that type of simulation is at increasing levels of nitrogen stress, the benefit from having Arancoma will increase until maybe we'll improve plant growth 60% by having Arancoma under nitrogen stress, phosphor stress, potassium stress. Of course, we, we use SimRoot to kind of guide empirical research. We don't believe a model until we validate it. SimRoot is not a predictive model. It's a heuristic model, so we don't expect it to totally predict field performance. But, but this guides our field research. So here we, for example, in South Africa, we're testing high and low Renkema maize lines at high and low nitrogen. And what we see in a variety of, of systems is if we increase the Renkema formation through, through just natural genetic variation, we increase yield uh, by 58%, just what Simrud predicted. The roots are cheaper, they get deeper, they acquire more nitrogen, and they, and they grow more. Uh, this is some data under drought stress in the field in on-farm research in Malawi where we're actually working with the farmers to do this. So we have high and low Arancoma lines that the farmers are already growing. And in, in different locations in Malawi, uh, the high Arancoma lines did much better under drought stress than the low Arancoma lines between 78 143% more yield under drought. So in this case, Simroot was guiding us into something that turned out to be very fruitful. In fact, this particular phenotype, uh, the, the high Arancoma lines are, are are being deployed in maize breeding in Africa now. Uh, let me give you another case study, uh, a case of what I call emergent biology, where Simroot suggested something to us that we did not think of ourselves, and that's the case of nodal root number. So an obvious uh, architectural feature of root systems is growth angle. that determines whether you're growing shallow or growing deep, and so this is one of the first things we tested. And so we asked Simroot if having steeper growth angles in maize helped us capture nitrogen. And when we do these studies, we change the phenotypic context. So we'll put steep angles or shallow angles in different other types of architectural phenotypes. So here we see uh, simulated uh, shoot mass here in this dimension in a low nitrogen soil. And we're changing nodal root growth angle here. And it's not, we're not presenting this in a way to focus on that because it wasn't that important the effect of root angle on plant growth in low nitrogen wasn't that large, to our surprise. But the model showed us, hey, you know what? There's another thing you changed that's really important, and that's the number of roots you have. That had a huge effect on biomass, something we hadn't really thought about. So here's a case where uh, an important point, I think, in, in modeling is that if there's sufficient mechanistic detail in your model, it's capable of predicting emergent properties that maybe you hadn't thought of initially. And here's such a case. So it turns out there is significant genetic variation for this phenotype in maize. So here's a, a genotype. We phenotyped uh, 5,000 genotypes of maize in the field. And we see from between 5 and, and 40 nodal roots per plant. So here's a genotype with a small number of nodal roots. Here's one with more. And uh, Simrit was telling us this was better. It's sort of a little counterintuitive that less roots would help you. Uh, so here's what Simroot is saying. So here's the seminal roots of maize. Here's the primary root. Here's the nodal roots coming out now. So this phenotype is a, a small number of nodal roots. 
representing what we do see in the field, and here's a larger number of nodal roots. And um, Simrud being, you know, having enough mechanistic detail about what the metabolic costs of root growth and the resource capture resulting from root growth, it says this is counterproductive for nitrogen and water capture. You have too many roots too close together. The plant is spending resources building things that are not helping you acquire more resources from the soil because they're just competing with each other. And this is actually more efficient, ending up with a deeper root phenotype. So here's, uh, with six nodal roots, you can see this phenotype actually goes deeper than this one with 46 nodal roots because now all these nodal roots are competing for carbon and so the individual roots cannot grow. That was the prediction from Simroot. Uh, once again, we take this to the field here in South Africa and also in the U.S. Under low nitrogen, we found that reducing uh, the genotypes that had, had, had more roots actually had less yield. So basically, uh, genotypes with fewer uh, nodal roots had 180% more yield under nitrogen stress, which is what Simroot had predicted. Under water stress, similar sort of thing. Genotypes with fewer nodal roots had significantly more yield under water stress, between 60, 116 percent more yield. So here again, you know, is an example of the model alerting us to things we should look at and allowing us to evaluate ideas on the computer before we do the go to the expense and bother of, of field work. So the third case I want to present is uh, the capability to consider trade-offs. Because in most uh, root processes anyway, there are significant trade-offs to any particular plant strategy or phenotype. And these can become complex. Once again, in your mind, you have some sense of potential trade-offs, but it's hard to quantify those. So here the model is useful in helping us quantify these trade-offs. So we're, in this case, the phenotype of interest is lateral root branching density. So this is natural genetic variation in maize roots dug up from the field, and you can see this Nodal root has a relatively small number of laterals, but they're longer and thicker. We call that the few long phenotype, whereas this genotype has made a lot of lateral roots that are smaller and shorter. We call that the many short phenotype. So modeling that in sim root, here again, these are the seminal roots. Here's the primary root. Here's the uh, nodal roots coming out. But now we've told sim root to, to have a, a sparse branching density here and a, and a higher branching density here. And you can see this is the few long and this is the many short phenotype. Now, sim root is mechanistic enough to know that if I have more lateral roots per centimeter, they're not going to have as much resources to grow. They're going to be carbon limited. They're going to be shorter. So we did not tell sim root to make roots lateral shorter or longer. It just figured that out. And sim root's telling us that this then is a better phenotype for water and nitrogen capture because individual longer roots can reach out and explore the soil for these mobile resources. So sim root's saying, under nitrogen stress, as a plant becomes increasingly nitrogen stressed, the optimal branching density declines. So under low nitrogen, you really want a small number of branches. And the opposite under phosphorus. Under phosphorus stress, as you increase phosphorus stress, the optimal number of branching uh, density increases. So here's a trade-off. Um, once again, we, we do field work. So here's under low nitrogen. We found that, as Simmer predicted, the few long phenotype had better growth and nitrogen capture, more yield under nitrogen stress. Under water stress, the few long phenotype, once again, had better uh, water capture, water status growth, and, and significantly more yield. So uh, confirming the phenotype. Now, Simon had predicted a trade-off saying that this is good for water nitrogen capture, but bad for phosphorus capture. That was also confirmed in the field, so we have phosphorus stress plants in the field. And the many short phenotype had significantly more water capture, or I'm sorry, phosphorus capture, and a small but significant increase in yield under low phosphorus. So the next case I want to consider is where the model helps us uh, evaluate and understand processes that are very difficult to measure empirically. I want to give you the example of the Three Sisters. The Three Sisters is uh, ancient uh, polyculture consisting of maize, bean, and squash. It's developed by... Uh, uh, Native American civilizations, such as those that lived here in Illinois, for example. This is actually the basis of our American holiday, Thanksgiving. Uh, that's actually not thanking some uh, European god. That's uh, the Native Americans were thanking these plants, uh, the, the three sisters, for their holiday. And so um, the, the three components of this polyculture, maize, bean, and squash, have different root architectures. And we wondered if uh, they were complementary. 
and this is, relative, is relevant to our, our work in Africa because polycultures are still widely grown in Africa. We wanted that by growing these plants together, they were more efficient, they were more efficient at capturing soil resources than growing them uh, side by side. So here, for example, similar visualization of the three components and you know, trying to figure, we're talking about things that happen, interactions that occur on the scale of a millimeter or less uh, over volumes of square meter or cubic meters. And so uh, this is the sort of thing that's hard to think about in your mind. It's dynamic. The resources are moving, the plants are growing, but Simmer is capable of doing this just through a brute force uh, finite element approach. And Simmer told us that the, uh, actually for nitrogen, having these three plants growing together increases the efficiency of nitrogen capture. So they are more efficient grown as a group than if you grew them separately. But for phosphorus and potassium, which are very immobile in soils, interactions were negligible. The roots were just not close enough to interact in terms of resource capture for these, for these resources. And this was helpful to us in our work in Africa because maize and bean are often grown together. Here you can see a maize root system and the bean root systems are just totally embedded within it. And we have uh, working with breeders to develop more phosphorus efficient bean lines and maize lines. And we were concerned if we would make the beans, for example, more aggressive at acquiring phosphorus, how would that affect the maize, which is the primary food source in these systems? And the model told us it really wouldn't matter, and then we did the field work, and sure enough, it really didn't matter. We could, these plants, even though it looks to our eye like they're closely interacting, in terms of phosphorus, they really don't interact. So the final example I want to tell you about, final case study, is just the exploring the phenome space, the large number of interactions of interest. Um, and so here, for example, is a heat map of a in a major system at flowering. But, um, you know, so this is architectural phenotype. And of course, this is, this is another functional structural model called root slice, which is at a cellular tissue scale, subcellular scale, where processes are happening at this scale. And these things interact with each other. Uh, of course, as biologists, we know this. So here we have two, two things I've talked about today, number of nodal roots on this axis, Arenchyma on this axis, biomass here at low nitrogen, and these interact. This is not, uh, this is a complex interaction. The more roots you have, the more important it is that they're cheap, okay? And if you, and that's very important at low nitrogen. If you increase the nitrogen, that function changes. And the same with phosphorus. And I think this is something biologists understand. The, uh, if the value of some phenotype is going to depend upon not only the environment, but other elements of the phenotype. And so this is a complex space. If we have n phenes inter existing in x states, they interact to create x to the n permutations. So this blows up quite rapidly. Uh, in fact, uh, we identified um, you know, 10 to the 23rd scenarios of interest for the root phenotypes we're interested in for nitrogen and phosphorus. Just that case for maize and bean, we have 10 to the 23rd scenarios. So. To tackle this, we've, we uh, uh, borrowed uh, tools from uh, uh, engineering, genetic optimization uh, modeling, where you have a decision space, in which in our case is what the plant is doing in terms of different root phenotypes, and then our objective space, which is you know, outputs like how much nitrogen or phosphorus did you capture, how much uh, biomass did you generate, and then we can uh, go through with a genetic uh, uh, algorithm where different elements of the algorithm represent uh, particular phenotypes, and then we begin to randomly mutate them or mate them, and then run Simroot to say, well, how do these offspring do? And just like a natural selection, we'll reject the worst performing offspring and save the best ones and then mutate those and so on. So we're just sort of reproducing what natural selection already does. And, and that allows us to go through, instead of looking at each and every one of the 10 to the 23rd scenarios, we can just look at this, follow this optimization front so the result is something like this. In this case, we looked at 10 to the 23rd possibilities. It took about a million hours of CPU time uh, to come up with just a few thousand optimum. Now, each, of these, each of these points on this surface, this is phosphorus availability, nitrogen, and biomass. Each of these points is a complete phenotype that takes about four hours to simulate. So you know, th this kind of illustrates, here we're looking at just root phenotypes for maize and bean, and there's a huge number of things we have to consider, and far exceeding the capabilities of empirical research. So I think this is another key um, utility for this kind of modeling, is allowing us to consider a lot of scenarios 
and find the best ones. So to summarize, uh, Sumer has been very useful in our work guiding the breeding of more drought tolerant, nutrient efficient crops. And this has been, uh, we've done this in beans, soybean and maize in Africa, Asia, Latin America. Um, I gave the example of uh, using modeling to evaluate the impact of variation for a particular phenotype, Arenchyma, uh, how it, we can discover new traits from this from the emergent biology. I gave you the example of nodal root number. It helps us to evaluate trade-offs, which are quite important in plant biology, certainly in roots. I gave you the example of lateral root branching density. It allows us to estimate processes that are extremely difficult to measure, like competition among roots. And then finally, it allows us to explore decision spaces that are simply too vast to explore empirically. Uh, Simroot is a, at core a uh, root structure function model. And my philosophy is that uh, the modeling community is best served by having robust modeling elements that interact in an ecosystem of, of other models rather than having one model try to do everything. But it could be linked and it could uh, be integrated with models of reactive transport, so microbes, next generation shoot models like the one here at Illinois to scale from gene to ecosystem to create an unparalleled discovery platform. So here's the, the people that are actually doing the work. Thank you very much. <laughs>